Welcome. This presentation is available for MCLE self-study credit. If you would like to receive credit, you must take three actions. First, click show more text below on our YouTube page. The text will expand and show a link to download the handout materials. Once you finish watching this presentation, please click the quiz link to receive self-study credit. Once the quiz is successfully completed, you will receive a certificate via email within 72 hours. We hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Sixty-three oh nine is now the law. What now? Um, today, our speakers are featuring Judge Lopez Skis, uh, ADR Services Inc. mediator, who uh, put together this program and panel today. Thank you for uh, setting this up for us, Judge Lopez Skis. Um, Judge Lopez Gis, uh was appointed to the bench in 2007 and served for 15 years as a judge uh, with the entirety of that time uh, on the bench devoted to family law. Um, she presided over thousands of cases involving all types of contested and complex family law issues. Um, and she's been known for actively and successfully settling her cases um, now as a neutral mediator and temporary judge in the private sector. She has a strong legal mind and coupled with her emphasis on collaboration to resolve family disputes, um, she's resolved uh, hundreds of matters now. So we're so glad to have you uh, with us giving the perspective of the former judicial officer and the uh, mediator today. Thank you, Judge Lopez Gis. Thank you. Um, next, we have Judge Lawrence Riff, who is on the LA Superior Court, um, serving two days a week in family law these days, right? Two um, days a month. Oh, two days it's, a month. But uh, it seems like two days a week. <laughs> <laughs> too excited to have you there. Um, so Judge Riff is a judge in the LA Superior Court and was previously supervising judge of the court's family law division. Um, he was appointed to the bench in 2015. And prior to his appointment, he was managing partner at a prominent Los Angeles civil litigation firm for nearly two decades. Um, he has written several articles and presented to bar associations and legal groups on many topics um, including today, where he is joining us to give the court's perspective. Thanks for joining us, Judge Riff. Thank you. And finally, from the practitioner side of things, we have Michael Hanasab, who is a partner uh, at the law firm Jamra Jamra and Hanasab LLP in Beverly Hills. Um, he focuses his practice on family law and works in cases involving high asset divorce, child custody, child support, domestic partnership, prenuptial agreements, property division, spousal support, domestic violence issues all across the board. Michael's got you covered. Um, he represents clients in Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, throughout Southern California, and California in general. Um, so thank you for bringing the uh, litigator's perspective um, to our conversation today, Michael. Thank you. Great. Now, without any further ado, I will hand the floor over to Judge Riff, who is going to... Uh, get us situated um, on what the statute is, and we can go from there. Well, thanks, Katie. And thank you, ADRS and Judge lopez Gis for inviting me to participate in this. It's a true honor. And I do agree with you, Katie, that Judge lopez Gis has a strong legal mind. You too, Michael. <laughs> this is, I think, the third time that I've actually presented on Family Code 6309, and the question might arise, why is this guy talking so much about this statute? The reason is that I had my fingerprints on this statute pretty early. I have the privilege of sitting on the Family and Juvenile uh, Advisory Committee of the Judicial Council, what we in the business call FAMJUV, and FAMJUV gets an opportunity to take an advanced look at legislation that's working its way through the system. The predecessor bill of 6309 found its way into the, into the FAMJUV um, committee and we discussed it. And a small group of us with, within the FAMJUV committee took it upon ourselves to circle back with Senator Min, his staff and his principal advisors to see if we could tighten it up and address concerns that uh, 
the committee had. So that is how I first got involved in the bill that became 6309. We worked pretty closely with uh, Professor Jane Stover at the University of California, Irvine, who runs the Family Law Domestic Violence Clinic, who happens to be married to Senator Min. So again, I had an early view of the statute. Now we are not, let me back up to say, I am well aware that since January of this year, 6309 is a hot button issue in family law. There, it Every time the subject comes up, it appears to me that, um, that blood pressure and respiration rise among practitioners and probably among judges as well for different reasons. Now, we are not here today, Judge Lopez against Michael and I, to debate the merits of this law, whether it's a good law or it's a bad law. I am not here as an apologist for the law. It's not my law. I just simply had some comments getting it to the legislature. It is the legislature's law, and accordingly, it is all our law. We are not here today to uh, debate among ourselves or to uh, entertain questions from the audience whether this statute is or is not more helpful to petitioners or respondents or to argue among ourselves which side is more likely to misuse the statute to impose hardship or vex the other side. What we are here to talk about is the practical reality that this is now the law of the state of California. And while it answers some very fundamental questions that have long been unanswered, it asks a great many more that are not answered. And our goal today is to speak with you all as practitioners to talk about what might be best practices for you as you, to ease your way through the courts. Now, the fact is that the DVPA broadly represents a collection of important social policies. And those policies often are in tension, if not in conflict. And I would suggest to you that 6309 is simply another aspect of that tension that resides within the DVPA. The policy clash arises from the fact that what we need in this state is a relatively simple and effective and prompt method of obtaining an injunctive order of relief from heinous, terrible violence on the one hand, but the need to protect respondents from the heavy hand of the state on very fundamental interests, including liberty, freedom of expression, relationships with children, and indeed confiscation, potential confiscation of property, as it were, in the form of financial orders that are enforceable by incarceration. And those latter sets of things we call due process. And it is the job of the courts to ensure due process to everybody in the DVPA, petitioner and respondent alike. We in the judiciary are well aware of the consequences of a finding of abuse under the DVPA, the consequences that arise under Family Code Section 3044, under 4230 relative to spousal support, not to mention the uh, bad things that flow from being in the CLETS system. So um, you will not find anybody on this panel here today to be other than sensitive to the due process rights of petitioners and of respondents. Now, moving on and quickly, I already am talking too much. So a long lingering question, in my opinion, since I've been involved in family law, which is only about seven years at this point, 
But a long lingering question has been, is civil discovery permitted in the DVPA? And what I've learned since 6309 became the law is that there is a pretty big debate among practitioners on the one hand and judges on the other as to that question historically. Many practitioners have long been of the view that of course so the Civil Discovery Act applies and they've lived their lives accordingly and been engaged in discovery. And the, for them, many of them see 6309 as um, unnecessarily interfering with something that was perfect, working perfectly well. Judges and judicial officers, on the other hand, in my experience, have not been of that view by and large. Most of us have been of the view that the Civil Discovery Act does not apply to uh, DVRO proceedings and the 6309 is a new thing. So a couple of key takeaways before I turn the floor over to others. Yes, the legislature has now answered a question. The Civil Discovery Act does apply to the DVPA. The answer is yes. Now, unlike civil discovery generally in civil litigation or in dissolution matters or other family law proceedings, Civil discovery under 6309 does not exist as a matter of right. So one of our suggestions to you is stop wagging your finger at the judge and talking about your entitlements and what your, what your rights are. You are entitled to discovery only if you can convince your judicial officer that there is good cause for that discovery to be had in a DVRO matter. The when of how uh, the when of how one obtains discovery, I'm saying that badly. One can seek discovery at the evidentiary hearing, not before. You cannot serve discovery before the evidentiary hearing, absent agreement from the other side. How do you seek discovery at the evidentiary hearing? You ask for it using, using your words, or you may do so in writing. Big takeaway number four, the court may permit discovery. The discovery you want may permit less than the discovery you want or may deny the discovery you want. And the court has a vast amount of discretion in deciding how to handle that. And as we will be discussing shortly, you should be prepared if you are seeking discovery or resisting discovery to be prepared to engage the court with a discussion of modifying or potentially modifying the TRO. And two more points before I stop talking for a moment. Look, most of what we're gonna be talking about today, almost all of it, applies to cases in which both sides are represented by counsel. When one is dealing with a self-represented litigant, uh, I think it's an entirely different CLE. We are not gonna be talking about that today. My point to you is there is nothing in 6309 that precludes counsel from talking to one another and agreeing as to civil discovery um, before the evidentiary hearing. So if, to, to those of you in the bar who tell me, but Judge Riff, everything was working so well before the legislature messed it up with 6309, we served deposition notices and people showed up and it was just great. I say to you, well, then keep doing what you were doing. Nothing in 6309 says you can't. I would also say that your judicial officer is going to expect you to have met and conferred and talked about your discovery needs, positions, objections before that evidentiary hearing. Don't just come in and drop it on the other side and the court. 
Last for now, one thing the statute specifically says is within the judge's toolbox is something the court always has had the power to do, but in my experience, rarely does it, which is to start the hearing, receive some of the evidence, maybe all of the petitioner's evidence in the petitioner's case in chief, then consider the respondent's request for discovery and potentially suspend the hearing to permit that discovery to proceed. So with that, I return, I guess, to whom? Judge Lopez Giz, is it to you? Yes, it's to me. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, part of the reason we are doing this today is because Judge Riff actually did write an article about 6309 and did a preliminary uh, MCLE about this topic. And this statute has raised so many questions in the last few months that we thought incumbent upon us to include um, Michael Hanisab because we want the people who are actually doing this to have a voice. And judges can sit around and theorize about how it's going to work and how people are going to handle it. But the actual practitioners, the people who are out doing this with the various types of cases are the people who are pretty much listening to this today. And we want to be responsive. And we also want to give you some insight as to where not only we're coming from, but our perceptions as to what this does and doesn't um, include. So to that point, uh, we wrote this hypothetical. We wrote several hypotheticals, but this is the first one. Um, you can all read it, but uh, I'll read it pretending I'm once upon a timing. The uh, temporary domestic violence restraining order was issued alleging the respondent, the father of the party's seven-year-old son, had over a period of months engaged in coercive control by cutting off use of the credit card, yelling at petitioner, belittling petitioner in front of the parents of the children at their ch child's school. The temporary order gave mom sole legal and physical custody of the child. At the hearing, respondent's attorney orally requested a con uh, continuance pursuant to Family Code Section 245 to take petitioner's deposition or in the alternative, asking petitioner for the names of the witnesses to the alleged conduct at the school. Additionally, dad argues that he wants to see the child. What do you suggest the respondent's attorney include in this request and what issues might petitioner's lawyer respond? And finally, what might a judge order? Does the court take the meet and confer efforts into consideration or should counsel at least advise the court of what the counsel tried to, tried to be prior to the hearing to obtain discovery? This, the case that is cited here, In Re Marriage of DS and AS, is an incredibly important case because I was at an AAML conference and the table I was uh, uh, working with said, isn't there due process anymore in family law? Does, it, does this statute do away with due process? The, the domestic violence, res, uh, violence restraining order statute absolutely includes do, the uh, uh, protections of due process, and this case says so. So if you're concerned that the court doesn't understand that due process requires both parties to have a fair hearing, allows the respondent to be able to respond to allegations this case absolutely says so, and it says so in, in firm words. Having said that, the question of what respondent's attorney might ask for, I'm going to pose to Michael. So, and before I get to that, I, I think it's important to kind of reiterate what Judge Riff said previously. When I first saw the statute, like many practitioners, I kind of threw my hands up saying, oh my gosh, what's going on? Are we not allowed to conduct discovery? And throughout this process, I think there's been a disconnect between the bar and the bench on what was allowed in the DVPA proceeding. In, especially in LA County, it was a custom and practice that discovery was almost certainly expected to be allowed, that we would serve a depot notice, that we would serve a 
document demand. It would be responded to. And as we were talking about the seminar, it was interesting because Judge Riff asked the question, which was, well, how many motions to compel did you file in a DVA, DVPA proceeding? And I stopped for a second and I thought, I, and I was like, minimal, if any. And the question was, if I did file that motion to compel before a judicial officer in a DVPA proceeding, would that motion have been granted? And before 60, 6309, 6309, the answer was probably not, because the bench view was that discovery was not allowed. 6309 has expanded that to allow for discovery to be allowed, which is a change. So now when you look at this hypothetical about what I would ask for, it would be showing up to the initial DVPA proceeding and asking for financial certain financial records that are detailed as to specifically as to specifically address the claim of mom or the petitioner on the DVPA action in this hypothetical for instance show me all show me the american express statements that show that i am no longer that i'm coercively controlling you by limiting your access to the credit card statement now if i went to judge riff and said your honor i need to, mom to provide all documents to show that I cut off the American Express that prove her point in her declaration that the American Express was cut off as of January 1, 2024. And that's all I'm asking for. And here is a demand with this one demand. My, my question to Judge Riff is, is, what would your thought be on something like that? I would turn to petitioner's counsel and say, how do you intend to prove that the respondent cut off the petitioner, the petitioner's access to the American Express. I'd start there because the what the petitioner's counsel might say is, well, I've got all the bills. I got all the statements right here. I plan to I plan to admit them. At which point I would probably say to you, Mr. Hanasab, I'm not going to continue the hearing so that you can discover those. They're right here. But okay. wouldn't you say that they have to be turned over? Of course. You... Yeah. And if Mr. Hanasab said there's there's a hundred pages here and you expect me to go forward, I'm not prepared to look at all those documents in five minutes to be able to proceed. And I did ask counsel for the other side for them before, and counsel for the other side told me, wait till we get to the hearing. And here's the letter that I wrote. What do you say then, Judge Riff? Well, I, I say a couple of things. Um, I, I might well say to Mr. Han Hanasab, look, let, let's hear the evidence. Let's hear exactly what the petitioner is going to say about this. Let's see if these documents can, are, are coming into evidence. Um, you certainly are entitled to see them and to use them today. If, in fact, you can't cross-examine without more time, I, I'll consider that. Now, what, exactly what I will consider remains to be seen. What I might be doing is uh, saying, I'll, I'll, call the, I'll call you back in 90 minutes. I'll squeeze you back in on the calendar today, or I may bring you back tomorrow. But I guess my point... Michael is I'm not I probably am not going to accept at face value without knowing more an assertion by either side that oh my god I can't do this unless I have a continuance to do discovery I'm going to ask very probing questions requiring detailed answers as to what and why before I do that Well, well let me say Sorry, go on. Well, let me just throw one other point on your side, uh, Michael, which is I specifically stated this was pursuant to 245, which means that um, the no response had been filed. So if no response has been filed, Mr. Hanisab gets his continuance. Without so a doubt. And I probably would order petitioner's counsel, get a set of these exhibits over there, you know, into in two business days, and I'll see you 19 days from now. And then what happens if I throw my hands up and say, Your Honor, but my client hasn't seen this child for 21 days. 
we're now going to go another 21 days. We're going over a month of my, of my client not seeing this minor child. Can I please get some custodial time pending the, the continuance? Can I make what? a suggestion, Judge Riff, before you answer it? Well, I want you to answer. Please, yeah. and, th please and thank you. Okay. Um, I found very, um, I found this thought or this practice very helpful. Uh, when I first took the bench and was sitting in Pomona, um, I had a lot of cases where people had come out of prison and had not seen their kids and came home, had an argument with the either the wife or the girlfriend and the mother of the children, and then there was a restraining order sought. But, um, and many times the reasons they were in prison did have to do with violence, so it was a concern. My my solution was monitored visitation. And monitored visitation sought by the respondent, in my mind, is a very good best practice because if they stand up, if the respondent says, well, my mom can help um, oversee it or my my uh, the, the cousin or the niece, there's too much bias there. If you have an independent monitor who is going to prepare a report and say, you know, mom and dad might have issues, but this child does or children do incredibly well with dad. That is that's solid gold, because then the, the issue of the continuation of the monitor becomes usually in most cases moot that the, the there has been a continuance dad has seen the child or the offender has seen the child and there's an independent uh person who has said it's there's not a problem so i know that most respondents get very upset with the concept of a monitored visitation and get offended but my experience has been the opposite that in the it's been a rare occasion where the person doesn't um, uh, act totally appropriately with the child when the other parent isn't around and there is a uh, a monitor. So um, I just wanted to throw that out. And I'd like to throw something out. Um, the hypothetical as presented is that the respondent is entitled to a continuance as a matter of right under 245. There's nothing new there. 6309 hasn't changed anything. That's just another day at the office. For but there's a blank. There's a blank judge riff because it could be written, uh, read another way. Well, we'll get there in a second. I, but this is what I was. I am wondering the following: We judicial officers are very used to that circumstance. Respondent says, "I want. I want my continuance, and uh, and I want to see the kid. I want the, the TRO mod modified." And that presents a certain constellation of tensions and problems. My question is, what if the respondent has already filed a response? And now that respondent comes in and says, well, I want a continuance as a matter of right, and I want to do discovery. So let's just stop right there. Talk to us about that new case Judge Lopez gives about... Uh, respondents filing responses. All right. There is a case and it's in the materials, N period M versus WK, and it's in the uh, best practices uh, documents. This case came out recently and um, the, the respondent had in fact filed a response and wanted a continuance to do discovery. But what the, and the court denied it in its discretion, but, but the court was very helpful in the language of the denial, indicating that respondent didn't say how uh, respondent was was going to be penalized, how what 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 consequences were going to be uh, met with or or experienced, and why the why the material was necessary. So, good cause isn't just because, and good cause isn't because or, or the or stating due process. Good cause is if I don't have the names of the school teachers who observed this conduct, I am not going to be able to talk to them. And by the way, Your Honor, 
if I want to subpoena these um, names of these witnesses, that's not governed by the um, Civil Discovery Act. I'm entitled to to issue subpoenas for their information. I'm entitled to get the records. I'm entitled to get body cam footage. I'm entitled to all of that under the um, uh, the statutes that that allow for subpoenas under CCP Section 1985. So when you make your request, if a response has in fact been filed, be specific as to why you need this information. And if it's appropriate, distinguish the information you want from the Civil Discovery Act. Because this statute, 6309, refers to the Civil Discovery Act. It does nothing to the Code of Civil Procedures with respect to subpoenaing witnesses and um, third-party documents. Yes, good point. Here's, and, and where I was going with my question is, is as follows. So let's say the respondent comes in and says, well, I want my continuance and I want to do discovery and I want to see the kid. So I want the TRO modified. Well, if if the respondent is not entitled to a continuance as a matter of right, now we're in the world of discretion, right? And so what I might do as a judge is say, well, what discovery do you claim to need? And then I will be thinking in my head, how long does one reasonably need to do that? I mean, if you need a deposition and if it's gonna be permitted, it doesn't have to be on 10 days notice. The court can shorten that simply by stating. And I guess my point to you, Michael, is that there are interconnections between potential modification of the TRO, the duration of the continuance, well, those two things for sure, and possibly even the nature of the discovery to be had. So. What I, well, of course, what I would be doing is I would be observing all of those things quite publicly on the record. The gee whiz, there's a lot of, a lot of competing issues here for the court to consider. And I might do this and I might do that. Counsel, go in the hallway and see what you can come up with concerning a modification to the TRO so that dad can see the kid. And maybe there's a monitor along the line of Judge Lopez's guess's excellent suggestion. And I'm thinking that it is for as a practice porter, it may be extremely helpful for the party seeking discovery to be able to advise the court that before we showed up at hearing number one, I met and conferred. I sent a letter to opposing counsel advising counsel in writing specifically what I want to do. For instance, if I want to take a deposition, that I'm going to limit the time of the deposition, I'm going to limit the inquiry. Uh, at the deposition to certain issues or to allegations set forth in the move-in declaration, and that I will potentially have safeguards in place, such as the respondent will show watch the deposition via Zoom instead of being in person. And as a practice partner, I think showing that to the court, in addition to saying, here's my limited request for discovery, here's why I believe there's good cause, also kind of puts a little feather in your hat that the court can look at and say, look, they tried to get this. It is a reasonable request. The sharp elbows that may be being played by the petitioner not to allow that discovery may have an impact on the court's view is the court has a lot of discretion in that. I think for sure. I think that if one does what you just said, you're the, you're representing the respondent. You get served with the, the DV100 and the hearing is in another 14 days. You communicate immediately to petitioner's counsel, look, this is what I want to do, and this is why I want to do it, and what can we agree on, and by the way, I want to modify the TRO. And you show up at the hearing and say, here is what I tried to meet and confer with counsel on, and all I got was, you know, a hand in my face. That can't help but make an impression on the court. So it will not help. And the other thing I would suggest, Michael, if you're representing the respondent and you want the TRO modified to permit some monitored visitation, show up with the monitor. 
Your Honor, I have here today the respondent's sister. I have here today the respondent's mother. Right here, put her under oath and ask her if she could monitor visits with my client and in, in, in a safe and in a safe way. She's right here. That's a great one, more thing, one more thing before we get to hypo two. Um, I I just want to say one of the concerns that was raised by counsel at some of the seminars I've attended um, is that the the um, prefatory language to this statute seems to um, assume that people who apply for these restraining orders are in fact victims, and it's been raised that um, that that the concern is that the court is going to already view a person who got a temporary order as a per, per se victim. And what the concern concurrent with that is that, well, maybe everybody was doing this by agreement beforehand, but whoa, now we don't have to because now you can't do it until the time of the hearing. And I, I just want to reiterate um my question to you, Judge Riff, and my uh, question to you, Michael, is that don't you think the meet and conferring component and the ability to show that you made efforts to try to work this out concurrent with the rules of due process will take care of the concern that now judges are going to say, well, maybe there is should be discovery, but it doesn't have to be. Michael? I mean, I would say absolutely. I, again, I, kind of the practice pointer would be, and I believe it's in our materials that you're going to, that everyone's going to get is there are sample letters that I believe are point four and point five in what would be the best practices for counsel that is in the material that provides letters that say, here's what I'm looking to do. I'm trying to resolve this informally. And as Judge Riff said at the beginning of this program, 6309 didn't hasn't changed how counsel can interact and resolve these matters. If counsel can agree to a deposition or counsel can agree to discovery, as we previously did before 6309, we can definitely do it now after 6309. Okay, next slide. Can I just comment on that before we go to the next slide? Sure. So I agree with you, Judge lopez Gis, that the legislative findings in section A and B of the statute, which, which language frequently uses the term domestic violence survivors, rankles the ears of many people in the community who say, well, you know, somebody is not a domestic violence survivor unless and until he or she establishes by a preponderance of the evidence that there's been abuse. Until then, they're simply making an allegation. So that's, I get that. And, and so people, some people do not like that language. Other people who typically represent petitioners, including in the, uh, the public service space, would suggest that those domestic findings don't go far enough in describing the abuse, actual and potential, that does arise from, um, from litigation, that litigation can itself be a form of abuse. So the legislature said what they said. And as I said earlier, we're not going to debate whether the legislative findings are accurate or not. I would suggest that everybody start reading at subsection C because that's what matters to you as a practitioner. And as to the courts, look, I mean, I'm only one judge, but I, I, I know a lot of other judges. I do not expect that the legislative findings are going to overwhelm the reason and training of the bench such that suddenly everybody is on the bench is going to think that... Um, that this is a petitioner favored statute. That's in my fact, opinion. Well, in fact, Judge Riff, doesn't this statute stop the petitioner from seeking discovery as well? So it, in reality, if I'm representing the petitioner and I want to obtain discovery, 
I have to follow 6309 as well, correct? That is correct. That is correct. Okay, shall we move to hypo two? Yes. Family Code 6309 requires good cause for discovery request, but Family Code Section 721B indicates that there's a fiduciary relationship that requires spouses to disclose, including but not limited to the other, as follows, providing each spouse access at all times to any books kept regarding a transaction for the purposes of expecting and copying. Family Code Section 271 allows for sanctions when a party prolongs or frustrates settlement. I wanted to know, Judge Riff and Michael, what both of you think about 6309 recon being reconciled with Sections 721 and 271. Because I think the real concern, and the re I actually wrote this question, was because people can't lose sight of the whole code. It is not one section. It is not 6309. It has to be read in conjunction with everything else, which actually gives balance to some of the concerns, even like to the American Express charges in the previous hypotheticals. So, Michael, I'd like to hear your thoughts about this. Well, first, this obviously deals with a situation where there is a pendant dissolution matter as well, not just a standalone DVPA case. I think before we get to 721, I think 271 is a very interesting point on this because, again, that meet and confer effort before you get to that hearing would speak volumes. You sat there, you wrote a letter asking for certain discovery, you get to the hearing, you show the judge that you tried it, you tried to resolve it informally, counsel refused to involve, resolve it informally, maybe you get a judge that finds good cause for some, if not all, of your requested discovery after the DVPA matter is finished and you're in the dissolution case or the you can then sit there and file a 271 motion and that's part of your evidence obviously it wouldn't be the only evidence you have because i don't think their failure to provide discovery pre-dvpa would lead to a sanction but that might be one piece of sanctionable conduct to show as for the fiduciary duty it's interesting because the code does say access it doesn't say produce and it does bring in a question of who has access to the records. So under the American Express example from the previous hypo, questionable whether the respondent has access to the American Express statements that the petitioner is alleging respondent cut her, him or her off of. So to me, if respondent has access to it and you request it under, two, uh, under the fiduciary duty statute, it may be that you already have access to it. It also may be, there, there's also no time limit under the current fiduciary duty standard. So you're on a, a short time leash in a DVPA proceeding. And in my opinion, probably shorter now with 6309. It's, I think the idea is that we were trying to get this case, these matters to here in as fast as possible and no more of the three, six month delays to get it done it's let's move and get this done i think you have you still have the access to it but whether or not you get the access before the dvpa hearing or not is what's questionable address i think your principal point is a principal point which is that 6309 does not preempt anything else in the family code. Now it does preempt something. It preempts the Civil Discovery Act to the extent that it is inconsistent with 6309, but it does not preempt the, the two statutes that you are referring to under the family code. Now that said, that, that is an important uh, legal and philosophical point to recognize. Whether it's an important practical point, I question. Because if one, if one is trying to use 721 to acquire information for use in a DVRO 21 days later, I would suggest that's a, that's a tough road to go. I think the better road to go is do it under 6309, uh, which is better designed 
for it. So it put it, putting it another way, I guess I've just never seen this, maybe because I've never practiced family law. I mean, do you, Michael, I'll ask you, do you write letters to the other side and say, I hereby demand access to the uh, American Express statements within the next 10 days under Family Code 721? Is that the kind of thing you do? You, you definitely have the ability to do it, and it depends on the matter of the case. Uh, I, there are definitely letters that are sent reminding spouses of his or her fiduciary duties under the Family Code. And there's definitely demands to access records. Now, whether or not you can demand the access within 10 days and try to have a workaround under 6309, I mean, I, I haven't seen it done yet. I don't know how successful you would be if you try to work around. Because I think if, I, I mean, to me, if I represented the petitioner and respondent was trying to demand access during the pendency of a domestic violence matter, I I may come into the court and I, I may object and let and come to the next hearing and say, Your Honor, they're trying to work around 6309. They, you know, filed this. I'm not saying I don't have a fiduciary duty to provide access, but what what's the purpose of this request? This isn't a fiduciary duty request. This is a discovery request. And they're trying to work around at the good cause requirement of 6309 and asking Your Honor to make the call. And I mean, I think I'd have a very decent leg to stand on if I came before you with that, with those facts. Beth, I, want, I, I want to, I want to cut you off for a second because this is the philosophical argument that I've heard since I first took the bench. I, this is my opinion, my opinion only. I think 721 of the Family Code is very specific about fiduciary duty with parties and. That fiduciary duty with parties in, in a marriage, and this goes to the crossover questions that a lot of the attorneys are asking about the 6309 in a, in a, in a dissolution action. The parties owe each other an obligation of good faith and fair do dealing to turn over documents. With that said, I've often puzzled about the discovery statute because I've always been of the opinion if you are now actually filing formal discovery after making a request, you're already looking at 271 because I think 721 makes you have to do it without necessarily even asking. You have to give that information and turn it over. So if someone was waving the flag of 6309 saying, you know, 721 is, is a subterfuge and trying to get around it, I would argue that they stand alone. You have in, in, a, in a crossover case, you have the obligation to turn over this information and to argue that somehow you're getting victimized by following what is the law and therefore now you don't have that obligation, I think is going way too far. And I, I didn't want to, um, um, you know, come in, in front of your answer, Riff, but I just felt that it. the reason I pose this question is because of the concerns of crossovers and also because of the obligation, absolute obligation under 721. Well, I agree with everything you just said, and I'm glad you cut me off because all I was going to say is that really anticipates hypothetical number three and the crossover problem. So why don't we go there? Michael? The parties are involved in a family law action, either a dissolution or parentage case. And while the family law matter is pending, one party files a DVRO. Does this stay any or all of the discovery in the in the underlying case? So, for example, we're in a family law matter. There's a demand served. And then a DVRO is issued or there's a deposition pending and the DVRO is filed. Is the discovery stayed or d does the deposition proceed as, as noticed? Judge Lopez, guess you want to take a swing? I believe that if you have this crossover action, that you have a right to discovery. Um, and if you're asking for information that is not necessarily involved in the restraining order case, then I think at that point in time, there it's a question of timing. And when would it be turned over? Because it's going to have to be turned over. Um, in in most cases, most discovery requests in a dissolution have to be turned over with with rare exception. And I don't think it was ever the intent 
of the statute to indicate that now if you're going through a dissolution that somehow 6309 cuts off civil discovery. It doesn't. I just think it's a matter of timing. Judge Rick, so, what do you think? Here's what I think. I think this is going to be the biggest problem facing judicial officers is the so-called crossover. Now, I am not on the California Supreme Court, you may have noticed. But if I were, and I were writing the majority opinion on how to deal with this, I would come up with a doctrine that um, looks to the dominant purpose of the, of the discovery. Is the dominant purpose to obtain evidence for use in a DVRO or not. I and it's not a it's not a great test because how would one know? But this is what judges do day in and day out. We try to figure out things like dominant purpose. Basically, I think if the dominant purpose is for the DISO or the parentage case, even though the discovery could have some utility in the DVRO, it goes forward. But if it's all a subterfuge and it looks like the dominant purpose really is for the DVRO, then I don't think it should go forward. And I'll tell you where it's going to really matter. I, I, I don't understand what you're saying. If, if the purpose of discovery is going to be to defend a DVRO, why wouldn't it be appropriate? Well, it would be appropriate if if it were brought under 6309. But if you're saying, if, if in your DISO case, you're serving discovery, you know, I want to take I want to take the petitioner's deposition in the DISO case, Judge, not for the the DVRO that is in 10 days from now. I'm doing it in the DISO case. Well, what do you want to? I would be asking questions. Well, what do you want to depose the petitioner about? Well, I wanted to depose the petitioner about um, our date of separation. Well, all right. Anything else? No. Well, okay. I'd probably permit that. I don't see what that has to do with the DVRO. And by the way, while I'm asking about data separation, I want to find out all about this coercive control stuff. Well, probably not so much, counsel. The other major point I would make, and this is going to be observed rarely, I think, in a perfect world, what I would do as a judge is I would try, I would postpone discovery in the underlying family law matter until the DVRO is conducted. Now, under the statute, that's supposed to be 21 days. But as we all know, in real life, that it can be well more than 21 days. It can be, as you say, Michael, three, four months. Sometimes the DVRO and parentage case can stand that kind of delay in discovery. Sometimes it can't. So that's another thing that has to go into the calculation. But, and and does, it not, does that dominant purpose not get more difficult when custody is at issue and there's custody in the DVRO? And yes. I think the time, I think first, I think the timing of when the depot notice, for instance, is served may help a court. So, for example, if I serve the deposition notice before the domestic violence restraining order matter was filed, that kind of shows that the depot may not be focused on the DVRO. What, now, if, you're, what if you're the party that filed both the depot notice and then the DVRO? Well, I mean, I think it gets interesting. And I think. I mean, I, I I pose the question of if I'm in the deposition and questions start going focused on the domestic violence restraining order, do I object under saying discovery is not allowed for DV under 6309 without good cause and a court order? Unless not, there's an agreement, unless there was an agreement to go forward. Correct. But let's say I say there is no agreement. Do I object under 6309? Say there's you haven't received an order from the court. There's no agreement. I'm going to instruct my client not to answer questions related to the DV pending the depot. And then, and, 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 I mean, qu query what a court would look like, what, what a court would think about on that. But Well, I'll tell you one thing a court would think. Don't instruct your client not to answer a question unless it involves privilege. 
But what you might do is suspend the deposition to obtain a protective order, which is a, a different thing. Right. This, this is another CLE for another day. But the way to handle that, in my humble opinion, is to say, counsel, I'm going to suspend the deposition to obtain a protective order on this line of questions. But before I do, is there any other line of question you may want to cover since we're here and a reporter's in the room? And see if you as far how far you can get in the depot before you suspend it. And what about the practice idea of this, Your Honor? We have, let's say the deposition falls a week after the first hearing. And it's brought up in the first hearing that there's a deposition. And I sit there and I say, Your Honor, I, I'm going to ask custody related questions at this deposition. It may cross on the on the domestic violence matter, but I'm, I'm not going to sit there and take the petitioner's declaration and question them. So what would you do if the judge asked a question like this? Well, all right, Mr. Hanasabi, you say you're not using it for the DV. If I have your stipulation that you will not use it in this DV RO proceeding, then fine, go ahead and take it. Do I have? Do you so agree on behalf of your client? I think that puts the practitioner in a very difficult position. You, you're going to take a deposition. You may get the petitioner or the respondent, depending on what side you're on, to say something that may be an inconsistent statement that may be used for impeachment purposes. I, I think, you know, if I really want to take that deposition, for instance, let's say I'm representing respondent, we're filing, we, we have a custody RFO that this court has decided to trail to follow the DV, because that's, I, in, at least in LA County, that's a standard procedure. I may say, Your Honor, I'm fine with that so long as I can use the, the, the depo for impeachment purposes only. I'm not going to use the deposition for any other purpose in this DV but for impeachment purposes, but I will use it for custody. I think that would be something to think about. And my sense of that, just to be clear, is I think you're right on, Michael. I think that, um, you know, we are in the truth business and there is nothing like a prior inconsistent statement to uh, to help us find the truth. I, I think it's asking a lot of counsel to say, and you can't use it even for impeachment. But Michael, isn't it true that before 6309, the depositions did take place um, by stipulation and there was in, in many, many cases before the, before the hearing? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even say, at least in L.A. County, I wouldn't even say it was by stipulation. I think it was a culture. I think culturally, as practitioners, we allowed for it. We did not want to be in a position where we would be looking like we're obstructing the issue, nor did we want the matter to be further continued. But, uh, you know, I, I, again, would turn this over to Judge Riff and ask, Your Honor, before 6309, I... If I was representing respondent, I noticed the deposition of petitioner. Petitioner's counsel said, no, you're not entitled to depositions in a domestic violence matter. I sit there and I follow an ex parte with a motion to compel saying, I want the deposition and I want it now. Well, what would the bench view have been? Well, I'll tell you what my view would have been and was. I only got two of those in, in my whole career. And... I was of the view on a very balanced, you know, knife edge set of policy determinations that discovery, civil discovery ought not be permitted in DVROs, recognizing full well the consequences of that ruling. Now, I will tell you, I informally polled recently 25 family law judges of our superior court and the vast majority of them were of the view prior to 6309, no, discovery was not permitted as a matter of right in DVRO matters. But of course, if counsel wished to do it, it was fine with the court. But and now to be clear, under 6309, and I know, Katie, we have we were we hit that one o'clock mark. But <laughs> now, just to put a little bow tie on this, under 6309, if I came in with that. At the first day of the hearing, I had a limited request for a deposition. Prior to 6309, the answer was probably no. With 6309, now if I can show the good cause, the answer would maybe yes in the discretion of the court, correct? Correct. And if not yes to the deposition, the judge might say, well, what is it you claim you need to know? Well, I need to know the name of the school teachers 
And the court might say, okay, I'm going to order petitioner's counsel by five o'clock tonight to get a verified response to you of the name of the school teachers. Now you don't need the deposition, right, Mr. Hanasab? Correct. Now, thank you, Your Honor. That's the kind of thing I think we are all going to be called upon to do under this vast discretion we have under 6309. ADR Services, Inc. has been your unwavering partner in alternative dispute resolution. But as the world changed, so did we. From virtual and hybrid hearings to our ongoing on-demand CLE program, ADR Services, Inc. continues to keep resolution and legal education at the forefront woman owned and operated from the start. There is someone for every situation. We are ADR Services, Inc.